Hello, David Diga Hernandez here. Welcome to Spirit Church. Today, I'm going to be talking about knowing Christ in greater depths. If in your heart you've been longing to know Jesus more and draw closer to God, then today is really going to bless you. We're going to get right into that. But first, Stephen Moctezuma is here. He's going to lead us in some worship. Thank you, Diga. You know, wherever you're at, just begin to seek God and just thank Him. Father, we thank you, God, for just the moments that you give us, God, with you. Jesus, let us find you, God, wherever we're at, God. I'll just sing out hallelujah. And hallelujah. 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 Oh, God, raise. Oh, just simple words, sing again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. For all God reigns. Just praise Him. as Stephen continues to play, I want you to just prepare your heart now because we're going to get into the Word and I'm going to be talking to you about knowing the depths of Christ. I want to pray with you before we begin. Normally, I wait to pray until toward the end of the Spirit Church broadcast and we are, we're going to pray again then too, but something in my heart just told me that there are many of you who are watching this, there's someone watching this and you're coming and you're watching this video, you're coming to this video tired and frustrated and weighing on your shoulders right now and everything within you wants to connect with the Lord you're saying Lord Jesus I want to know you in greater depths I desire to understand who you are more and more and I want to step into closer relationship with you I want to step further into this journey with you than I've ever stepped before and that's somebody but you're hindered right now because there's so much on your mind there's so much coming against you there's so much that you can look at and be distracted by, but I want to pray with you that the God of all peace, that the Prince of Peace would touch your life right now and that God would bring a calm in the midst of the chaos, that God would bring a confidence in the areas where you feel the weakest. So Holy Spirit, I pray for that one watching right now 
in Jesus' name, Lord. I pray that you help to settle the heart, settle the mind, and settle the soul. Lord, let every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God be brought down into captivity in Jesus' name. Lord, let the frustration and the, and the anger and, Lord, the doubt and the fear, let it all fade away now. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And I want you to say it. Say, amen. It means you agree. So we're going to get into this. Now, interesting times we're living in. A lot of stuff going on right now, but whatever it is that you think of what's happening right now, I want to remind you that God is in control and that there is nothing that can happen to upset the kingdom of God here in the earth. I do not become bothered when the world is the world. Um, I don't become fearful when wicked people in government or wicked people in rulership or wicked people in any form of authority choose to make decisions that go contrary to the word. So it was on my heart to minister this message because there are many who are wanting to know Christ in greater depths. Now, let me tell you something. Now, more than ever before, it's important that we become rooted in Jesus. Now, especially in these times, it is so important that we understand the nature of Christ, that we understand the person, that we understand who he truly is, that we understand the magnitude of the person with whom we are dealing, that we are talking about God, the one who spoke all of reality into existence. And so when you are grounded in him, when you know him, it's impossible, let me tell you something, it's impossible to be swept away by demonic doctrines when you're rooted in Christ Jesus. So especially in these times, it's so important that the believers become more rooted than they ever have before. Let me tell you something, I'm excited about everything that's going on in the world. Many people are afraid. I mean, you talk about what's going on with ISIS. You talk about what's going on with Greece and their economic instability. You talk about what's going on here in the United States where they just, the Supreme Court just legalized in all 50 states, same-sex marriage. You talk about a rampant abortion in this nation. You talk about a changing and growing culture. And it can become somewhat intimidating if you forget who we are that we are the church of the living God and the truth has prevailed through kingdoms and civilizations and nations and even rulers who tried to oppress the truth. The truth can never be silenced. And so what's interesting is now that believers, you're going to find, as you've been finding, that the world has moved from loving us or tolerating us to attacking us. So in other words, the church has gone through these three phases just in the past several decades. We have gone from being celebrated to tolerated to hated. And Jesus said that would happen. So it doesn't concern me. It doesn't concern me when people do such things because here's the truth. God's setting the nation up. This is how God sets things up for great awakenings. This is how God sets up the nations to experience the revival that he has planned for that nation. This is how God sets up the nations. It's like chess pieces on a board and God has everything set and he's going to move sovereignly in this nation. Let me tell you something. If Abraham could have found 10 righteous in the land, God would have spared that land. And in this land, there are more than 10 righteous. And you and I are the preservation of nations. You and I are the salt of the earth. And so long as we are here, there is hope for a turning. There's hope for renewal. There's hope for awakening. And I say all that because it has to do with what I'm talking about. Um, because I don't want to sound hateful. Let me tell you something. And I'll just say this because people are going to you know, want some very direct responses from me. Um, let me just say this. The Bible teaches that homosexuality is sin. There's no way around that. There's, no, there's nothing you can do to maneuver around that text, okay? I mean, we're talking Romans, we're talking Jude, we're talking 1 Corinthians 6. There's nothing, I mean, Levitical law, obviously, that's funneled through the cross, and everything with Levitical law uh, was absorbed in Christ's life. But we're talking New Testament now, and there's really nothing anyone can do to get around that. I mean, and they may try, but the Bible is very clear. Having said that, I was just talking to my, 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 my team here, and they asked me if I was going to address it. And at first, I thought I wasn't, but, you know, after prayerfully considering it, I, I thought it's important just so you, as my ministry partners, and you who are members of Spirit Church, you who follow this channel, so that you understand where we as a ministry stand on these issues. 
Now, I'm not going to go campaigning against it. I'm not going to go trying to undo what the Supreme Court did. Look, the world's going to be the world. Let them do what they're going to do. It doesn't affect us so long as we keep preaching the gospel. So if I start attacking one particular sin, I got to go start attacking all the other sin. When my message is not the attacking of sin, it's the preaching of salvation from sin through turning to Christ Jesus. Jesus said when you preach the gospel, preach repentance and the remission of sins. That's what we preach. So all sins need to be repented of. Um, having said that, so that I don't sound angry, if you're someone who comes from that lifestyle, or you're from the world, or you're not a Christian, uh, I'm not talking to you right now. This is spirit church. This is for believers. So as to not come across hateful, know that I'm just being very candid. I'm just being very matter of fact. I'm not being very, um, I'm not approaching it with uh, emotions considered right now. This is just for the church. What does concern me are the believers or so-called believers who will stand and say, well, they stand and they say things that are supportive of it. And I can go on all day about why it's not the same thing as interracial marriage. I can go on all day about why it's, it's unhealthy for our culture. It's unhealthy for the individual psychologically, uh, physically, uh, emotionally. We can go down that road, but really that's not what this lesson is about. What I thought about this was that, Lord, we need to be rooted. It is so important that we as the people of God become rooted in Christ Jesus. So I looked at the verse, and this is pretty astounding here. It's going to be in Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 1. This is what the scripture says. Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. Watch out for those dogs. There, he's being real seeker sensitive there. He says, watch out for those dogs those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort, though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. So Paul the Apostle is saying here, look, we can't put our confidence in our accomplishments. We can't put our confidence in our religious capability, in our disciplines, in our beliefs, in our rigid, strict order of life. He says, if anybody could boast in what they did as a religious person, if anybody could truly boast and say, look, by accomplishment, it means something, or by accomplishment, I can get in, or by accomplishment, I could be counted as worthy. Paul the Apostle says, if, anyone who, if there's anyone who can say that, it's me. That's what he's saying. He, then he gives a reason for that. He starts to list all of his credentials, his religious credentials. Verse 5, he says this, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I, I obeyed the law without fault. Then verse 7 says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ. Verse 9, and become one with him. I no longer count my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. So Paul the Apostle is saying, look, when you come to know and understand, when you come into contact and you touch and you connect with Christ in a real tangible and true way, when there's an authentic divine connection that is established between you and the risen Christ, then false doctrine begins to become exposed. Everything about the false doctrine that he was a part of, everything about the religious order that he was participating in, Everything about that, not only did he see that it was not valuable anymore, but he also saw it for what it truly was. So to expose false doctrine in your life, in order to have the deception unveiled from your eyes, you have to connect with Christ. The scripture says that, uh, describing the context of the last days, that the, there, this will be a time when even the very elect will be deceived if it's possible. We need to be on our guard. We need to be watchful. We need to be vigilant. We need to be rooted. So Paul the Apostle is saying, look, when I connect with Jesus, when I truly come to know him and who he is, 
all of the false doctrine, all of the religion, everything that I was once a part of, it's nothing. Not only is it nothing, I see how deceptive it truly was. Paul the Apostle's eyes were open the moment he came into contact with Christ. And the same is true of us, that if we will keep our eyes on Jesus, if we will stay focused on who he is and and completely give ourselves to the person of Christ, then everything else will find its place. And so he prefaces these statements. So he prefaces the verse that we're about to get into. Now, Paul sees the weakness of the false doctrine when he comes into Christ, as we saw in verse 8. And then verse 10 or 11 says this, and this is so powerful. So remember, he goes down the list. This is the context here. He's going down the list. He's listing his credentials. He says, ah, but now that I've met Christ, I realize that's nothing. And now that I met Christ, I realize that wasn't even the way to get in. So two things happened when he met Christ. He no longer valued the things of this world. And secondly, he was no longer deceived by false doctrine. And so then he goes on to say this. And this is verse, let's start at verse 10. He says, I want to know Christ and experience the power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. I love the way the King James puts it. I believe the King James puts it. I don't know if I can quote it verbatim, but it says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And then verse 11 says, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Now, this is a powerful verse. Because in this verse, Paul is saying, I want to know three things. He says, I want to know him, the person. I want to know the power that raised him from the dead. Or I want to experience the power that raised him from the dead. Number two, the power. And then he says, and I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to share in his pain. Number three, the pain. So Paul wanted to know the person. Paul wanted to know the power. And Paul wanted to know the pain. He also wanted to know the promise, which is salvation. That's an entirely different message for an entirely different time. But Paul wanted to know Christ in these depths. He was so passionate to know Jesus that he wasn't satisfied seeing him in one dimension. It's almost as if you saw a painting of Jesus, you could see the two dimensions. But if you actually saw Jesus in person, you could see all three. So Paul is mentioning the three dimensions here by which he comes to know Christ. And that is the person, the power, and the pain. Each experience, each understanding As you come to know each one of these things, you come to know Christ in greater detail. It's like different colors on a painting and they're coming to form an image and more detail is being presented before your eyes and the eyes of your heart begin to behold the master with vivid, intense reality as the Holy Spirit reveals him as we begin to know the person, as we begin to know the power, as we begin to know his pain. Number one, Paul wanted to know the person. How do we come to know this? You know, Paul didn't consider himself as having obtained it. There are people who say, I have everything I need in Christ. And though I agree with that to some extent, they say that to imply that they don't need to learn, that they don't need to grow. I heard someone say the other day that they don't believe there are different levels of the anointing. It's only logical to conclude that there are different levels in the anointing. For if I can grow in something then there are therefore levels of something. If I can grow in maturity, there are levels of maturity. If I can grow in power, there are levels of power. If I can grow in truth, there are levels of truth. If I can draw closer to Christ, there are levels that I can have in my relationship with Christ. Yes, Christ purchased the way, but the Holy Spirit shows the way. And the Holy Spirit shows the way if you will look for the way, if you will dedicate yourself to finding Him. So, Some say, well, we already have it. We've already obtained it. We don't need to seek anymore. We don't need to ask anymore. And they act as if they don't need to be taught. They act as if they don't need to mature. They act as if there are not different levels of the anointing when there most certainly are. And you can grow in all of those. And so Paul the Apostle even says, look at the verse after this, verse 12. He says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to reach that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what is ahead. Verse 14, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus 
is calling us. Now, this is powerful because not even Paul the Apostle considered himself to fully know Christ yet. How can we? I mean, this man wrote most of the New Testament. We can't consider ourselves as having arrived if Paul the Apostle hasn't either. And so this is what the scripture says. It says, that I may know him. You know, the person of Christ is much more than you might think. So number one now, the person. We often say, you know, when I get to heaven, I'm going to walk up to the throne room of God and I'm going to ask him this. I'm going to ask him that. I'm going to eat over here. I'm going to, you know, and, and I'm not trying to be critical, so please don't feel like I'm being critical. But, you know, there's this culture that's permeated the church and it's, it's very, it, we've grown very aloof to God. It's almost like this hippie culture where it's like, oh, he's my daddy. He's my buddy. He's my, you know, that's, that's what they call him. And I'm, I'm all for terms of endearment toward God for the scripture says we call him Abba Father. But this lackadaisical attitude, this aloof approach, this lack of reverence, this lack of holy fear and trembling when we speak of God as if, oh, you know, he's just our buddy. That's not the case. I mean, Revelation describes his throne as having lightning proceeding from it, that he has eyes like fire, that when he speaks, his voice is like the rumbling of many waters, that, that there's thunder and lightning around his throne, that creatures fly about, that there's this immaculate heavenly display when we approach the throne. In fact, everyone who even caught a glimpse of him fell face downward in dread. They fell to the ground trembling and shaking and awestruck. The children of Israel, they couldn't even approach the mountain. And some will say, well, yeah, well, now we can approach through Christ. Yes, we approach through Christ, but I'm talking about God the Father, whom Christ is a reflection of. There still needs to be this reverence. In fact, when Jesus walked around, there was the scripture that where the men who were on the road to Aramaeus said, did not our hearts burn? He had such a power about him that just being even near him changed the very atmosphere where he was. We're talking about a holy God here. Even when he spoke, people said, we've never heard anyone even speak like this. This is the person. There is great depth to him. There is great depth to him. It's not shallow. It's not, oh, I'm going to go have a cup of coffee with him. It's knowing and understanding. You explore Christ as if an explorer would explore the vastness of the ocean or the cosmos, standing on the very verge, the very edge of something greater than oneself. You're inspired and you get this sense that you're stepping into something greater than you. Let me tell you something. There have been meetings that we've had as a ministry where the glory of God rested so heavily on that place that it was terrifying. That people began to tremble. They didn't go jumping around and shouting and laughing and that's all part of different moves of God. But I'm talking about touching the deep, deep glory. I'm not talking about New Ageism. I'm not talking about spiritualism. Much of that is coming to the church and it cheapens what you would call glory. The glory is the full weight, the fullness of who he is. And he's holy. And he's majestic. And he's grand. That's the person. There is great richness in the person of Christ. Even as I'm talking, you're longing to know him. That's because when you talk about how great he is, it inspires a thirst, a hunger. You thirst after him. You long for him. David the psalmist wrote, As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after thee. And let me tell you something, believer. That longing was placed there by the Holy Spirit. He wants to draw you in. He wants to take you to the places of knowing and understanding his nature. Not just understanding his actions. See, some believers, they understand his actions and they go from event to event because they want to experience his power, which is good. But I want to understand his ways. So the person is known by the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, you can read it later. For the sake of time, I won't be able to read it now. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, 12, and 13 are all great verses that talk about how only the Holy Spirit can give Revelation. So number one, the person is known by the Spirit. You look in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
John 1, 14, and the Word became flesh, and we beheld His glory, full of grace and truth. And the Scripture describes this fleshing out of the Son, this creation, this incarnation, where the Holy Spirit takes God the Son, God the Word, and He manifests Him as a vivid reality in our world. So the Holy Spirit reveals the Son. The Holy Spirit can reveal Christ to such vivid reality, such intense reality, that He can become more real to you in a moment than your surroundings or even yourself. Christ can become more of a reality to you than yourself. And that's only by the Spirit. So it's always the Holy Spirit who takes the Son and brings Him about as a revelation. So that's number one. Paul wanted to know the power and the power, the person, and the person is known by the Spirit. Number two, Paul said, I want to know His power. And the key to knowing power is surrender. Now, I'm not saying that God can't use anybody. I mean, God spoke through a donkey. God can use the sinner. I mean, he used, you know, Rahab. I know a pastor who before he got saved, because he had grown up in church, he was drunk and his friend asked him to lead him to the Lord. You know, you know, Ron Simpkins, he tells this story all the time. And he, he says that at a bar or someplace like that, his friend was under heavy conviction. And while Pastor Ron Simpkins was drunk, he led his friend in the sinner's prayer to the Lord. Now, God can use sinners. God can use donkeys. God can use sometimes disobedient people. I mean, look at Jonah. He was running from the call of God. He, he was on the boat. He was heading away from where he was supposed to head to Tarsus, uh, not to Tarsus, to Nineveh. And so he's heading away. And the men on the boat, as Jonah is disobeying God, the men on the boat come to know the Lord while he's running. So God used Jonah to save those men. So I'm not talking about those exceptions. But someone who wants to surrender life, someone who wants their life to be continuously used by, by God and by the power of the Holy Spirit, you have to surrender. So sanctity is part of surrender. Yielding is surrender. Willingness is surrender. Humility is surrender. God can only multiply what you give. He can only fill what is empty. He can only empower what is surrendered. You cannot be filled with power if your life is full of self. You have to become empty. John 3.30 says, I must decrease, but he must increase. So that when I surrender, when I present myself as a living sacrifice, when I lay down my life, I say, Father, I want to know your power. Put your power on my life, and he'll do it if you'll surrender. If you'll say, Lord, take all that I am. I'm not going to ask questions. I'm not going to put conditions you use my life how you want. So number one, the person is known by the Spirit. The power is known by surrender. James 4, 7 says that you draw near to God and He will draw near to you. You have to initiate it through surrender. So we see that the person, again, is known by the Spirit. The power is known by surrender. How then do we know the pain? So Paul so desired to know Christ. Think about this passion to know Christ. He so desired to know Christ that he even wanted to share his pain. He was so intrigued, so fascinated by the person and the image of Jesus that he said, if I can understand him from just one more angle, if I can understand him just a little more, if I can come to gather the richness that is the revelation of his person, if I can just eat of that revelation just a little bit, I'll suffer for it if I have to. I'm not talking about buying the anointing. Christ already paid for it. But I'm talking about walking worthy as Ephesians chapter 4, I believe verse 1 tells us to do. I mean, Ephesians 1 through 3 tells us that the gospel is all uh, Christ works, that it's finished. There's the mystery of the gospel. And then he says, in light of all of this and the fact that God has worked all this out for us, he doesn't say now relax and just soak it in and do nothing and let God take care of it. He says, now walk worthy. And so we have to walk worthy. And we do so in the fellowship of sufferings. So again, I'm not talking about purchasing salvation. I'm not talking about purchasing power. I'm talking about understanding Christ. And we understand him because we suffer with him. So Isaiah chapter 53 verse 3 says that he was rejected and despised. We will be rejected and despised. Galatians 2.20 says that I'm crucified with Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 31 says that I die daily. You know the person through the Spirit. 
the power through surrender, but you're going to know the pain through sacrifice. And really, I hesitate to even call anything sacrifice because anything we give unto the Lord, He's going to give it right back in greater measures. So you can also say it as submission. And that is somewhat of a sacrifice, but you have to step out in faith. There's a price to pay for the anointing. Let me tell you something. You think this all comes, I mean, people look, I mean, I'm just going to share my testimony with you right now. And don't take it as bragging. This is just my story. But, you know, you look at what God has blessed me with. And you look at the television ministry. You see the people healed. You see the power and presence of God touching people. You see the influence. You see the revelation. This comes at a price. And that price, I wish he would increase the price of it because it's prayer. It's spending time with the Lord. It's staying away from evil. This doesn't just come in a day. This doesn't just come in a week. This is years and years and years of faithfulness. You know, I've been, I'm 26 now. I've been in the ministry since I was 13 years old. I'm not talking about paying your dues. This is not a union. God, the kingdom of God doesn't work that way anyway. And this is not about seniority. The kingdom of God doesn't work that way either. This is about the heart. And God works on the heart over long periods of time, even though he does miraculous moments where he touches the heart. But I'm talking about experiencing and suffering with Christ the pain. People often say, oh, you disappoint the Lord with your sin. Well, if he loves me enough to be disappointed by me, surely he loves me enough to be elated by me. You know when you worship him, when you obey him, that you touch his heart and you make him glad? Think about that. That is, that is so powerful that you can make God glad. And so when I talk about the fellowship of his suffering, you know that when you're in pain, when you're in a time of great struggle, when you're in a time where you're saying, Lord, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know how I'm supposed to get through this. People are persecuting me. People are hurting me. I, I feel disconnected. I, feel, I, I, remember we, I prayed with you at the beginning because I sensed that was you, or some of you watching at least. But... Really, when you're in pain and you worship in your pain, that's fellowship of his suffering. It draws you closer. God will do more through, you, through your pain. God will do more through your pain than almost anything else. When you worship in your time of pain, you're fellowshipping in his suffering. Don't waste the time of pain. Don't waste the hurt. Don't waste the rejection. Don't waste the calamity. Don't waste the trial. Don't waste the circumstance. Worship. Obey. Love God. And when you worship in your time of pain, it'll draw you closer, and it's the fellowship of His suffering. This is your opportunity. What a privilege it is. What a joyful, glorious privilege it is to share in the fellowship, in the fellowship, in the union, in the connection with Christ's suffering. That I may know him, that I may know him. You come to know him in your pain. You come to know him in your problem. When you can worship him in your time of despair, you're connected to the divine. Don't let your pain go to waste. Let it be the fellowship of his suffering. By whenever you worship, he comes nearer. Whenever you worship, he's drawn closer. So when you worship in your pain, he's near. The scripture says he's near to the brokenhearted. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. When you're in pain, you're humbled. It is in the brokenness that we find our dependency. It's the blessedness of brokenness. When you realize, really... There is great liberty in realizing one's own brokenness. For in such realization, we find a greater dependency upon the Holy Spirit. And it's the fellowship of His suffering. That I may know Him. That I may know I just want to know you, Lord. I remember when I used to pray, when I first got saved, when I used to pray prayers like, Lord, I want to know you. I still pray, but when I first started, I, I remember my whole body would tense up. I, I thought that it was in physical or emotional tension that I could really yearn from. And I remember just saying, Lord, I just want to know you. I, I, don't, I, don't, I care about ministry, but in comparison to knowing you, I don't care. In comparison to knowing who you are, in comparison to connecting with you, in comparison 
to understanding the great riches of the revelation of the person of Jesus. Nothing else compares. I count it all loss. It's nothing. Let's pray that you would be drawn in closer. Father, in Jesus' name, touch that one watching. Let that one be drawn closer to you. Lord, they want to know the person. Let them meet the Spirit in the Word. Father, they want to know the power. Thank you for the privilege that we can pay that price. Thank you that we can pay the price. Let them pay the price for the anointing, Lord. Let them, for the power, be surrendered. And Father, in Jesus' name, that we would know the fellowship of your suffering. Let not our pain go to waste. Let not our problem go to waste. Let not our despair go to waste. Let us fellowship, let us worship in that time of suffering and be drawn closer to you. In Jesus' name. Don't turn off the video yet. There's somebody watching me. Lord, help me get this right, Lord. I, I want to make sure this is you every step of the way. I see there's a problem. There's an infection right in your throat, and it's toward the back, and it moves up, and it's affecting your ears, sinuses, everything. God's bringing healing to you right now. Lord, in Jesus' name, let the healing power of God begin to flow and touch that one watching in Jesus' name. There's a woman watching. You're wearing something red. There's a woman watching. You're wearing something red. It's like a reddish shirt. And you're praying for your son. You're concerned for him. God's going to take care of him. His name starts with a D. I, I, I'm just getting a D. You're, you have a white red shirt. You're praying for your son. His name starts with a D. And you're believing God to touch his life because you've seen, you've been concerned about the influence of people that have come into his life, and you're praying for that to be separate. You're concerned for the music he's listening to as well. And God's going to set him free. Wow. God's really moving. Well, before I head out now, and before we bring Spirit Church to close, Spirit Family, you're a member of this church. Remember to support this, guys. We need all the support you can get. You're receiving from this ministry. You love this ministry. You're blessed by this ministry. Look, we don't, we don't want to just continue doing what we're doing. Well, we want to continue what we're doing and do even greater things. We have some big doors opening. Don't, I don't want to have to say no. I want you today to sow into this ministry. You're watching this on YouTube and you're just searching through videos. You're not planning on giving, but God's speaking to your heart. $100. I just heard that someone's going to sow $100 into this ministry. That's you. Because before I said it, it was in your heart. Go obey the Lord. Go do it. I'm challenging you to do it because when you do, God's going to meet you at His word. He's going to meet you at His promise. There's somebody who can sow $1,000 right now into this ministry. And you're going to help the gospel. You're going to help with the evangelism. You're going to help with the television. You're going to help with spiritual. You're going to help with the projects, various projects that we do. So go ahead, do that today. Support this ministry. If you're a friend, if you're a, watch, a viewer, I'm challenging you to do it. We need your help, guys. I need your help. I need my brothers and sisters to come alongside me and stand with me as I continue to preach the gospel and we continue to see lives change. Remember, if one life can be changed by the gospel, that implies an entire nation, an entire world can be changed. So let's do it together. So today, thank you for it. I will see you next time at Spirit Church. And until next time, remember this, that nothing, absolutely nothing, is impossible with God.